Uh, hi, I'm Frank Coleman, and this is Thelma. Uh, Thelma is Daddy's girl. Thelma, <laughs> hi, sweetheart. Daddy's a little meatloaf. Uh, this is this is what this is what she does every day. She comes and sits on my chest, and I have to work with one hand. Uh, I wanted to show you something that um, that happened that I did. Uh, that um, just a quick off the cuff little project that came off kind of cool and. Uh, in the process of showing you what I did, uh, show you a few tips and tricks about Final Cut and about iPhone video and stuff like that that I discovered along the way. Boy, you know, Apple sure doesn't make it easy for you sometimes. Um, one of the nice features on the iPhone is slow motion mode. Slow mo. Uh, it's in the uh, in the photos uh, in the uh, the camera program here. Let's see open my camera this is also the first time i'm trying digitizing recording a video talking about this stuff while also grabbing the video from my iphone at the same time so the slow-mo uh thing is an option uh here on the phone and uh it's snowing it's snowing in new york city so i went and stuck the camera out the window and took a couple of seconds of the snow falling on the lovely park across the street in slow motion and uh, what I want to do is I want to take that and bring that into Final Cut and make like a, a seamless loop out of it, stabilize it because I did it handheld and, and make a seamless loop out of it that I can use as a, a background for video for whatever, for my purposes or my wife's purposes for wonderful plays perhaps or something. So uh, so that was the idea. Now here's the thing. Slow motion video, when you record slow-mo on your iPhone, you may have noticed that when you bring it into the Photos app on, on your Mac, uh, and try to export it and all like that, like it loses its slow mo -ness. It loses the its property of being in slow motion and it reverts back to being a regular video. Or if you try to email it to somebody or send it in a message or basically send it anywhere outside of the Apple ecosystem, ecosystem meaning programs to play them in, specifically photos, then it loses that property. Well, okay, so there is a workaround for this. Uh, and uh, let me see if we can see this. This is the uh, footage that I that I shot earlier on the phone of the snow outside the window. Uh, and here's what you got to do. I'm going to jump out of this. You have to use iMovie on the phone. And here's iMovie over here. Now I've already walked through this, so uh, I can show you what the project looks like. It basically will end up looking like this. But the idea basically is you make a new project, you, want, you say you want it to be a movie, here's the movie, you pick the movie out of your, uh, out of your photos bin uh, and say create movie. And there's the movie, and it, look at the time at the bottom, it says 44 seconds, the original was 5 seconds, so already I know that this one's got its slow motion property. Yes, by golly it does. Okay, so when I say done here, uh, and go and, and click the uh, share icon at the bottom. I can save it. I can send it anywhere I want to and uh, it will in fact maintain those properties. <clears throat> so so that's that. I, I can get out of this now because I've already I've already pre-baked this in a 350 degree oven. All right, so then uh, let's go over to uh, to Final Cut here and I'm going to uh, import that import that video. I actually already sent it over to myself via, I think I did it via AirDrop, uh, and here's here's the movie right here. This is the one that I exported from iPhoto. It slows down the audio as well as the, as well as the video. So, so basically what it's doing is it's recording, um, it's recording uh, the scene at a much, much higher frame rate than normal uh, and what that means is it's got a lot more information about the scene it's normally it records it at 30 frames every second and what it does in slow motion is it records it at 120 or even 240 frames every second well if you stretch out those frames interpolate them as as 30 frames a second stretch them out over time it'll look like have the quality of a regular video but time will be slowed down proportionally eight times actually uh, and that's and that's what happens here. But uh, there's a couple of things. One, it's in color, and I want it to be in black and white. And two is that it's handheld. If I scrub along here, you can see that you know it's handheld, 
And three, there's a person walking along the bottom there. What I ultimately want to end up with is a seamless loop. Also, when you look at the last frame, and then you go to the very first frame, <laughs> yeah, there's a very definite difference there. Okay, so that's going to be that's going to be difficult to line all that stuff up. Well, maybe not maybe not so difficult. So, so here's here's what happens. I'm going to make a new project from scratch in Final Cut. I'm just going to close this thing, and I'm going to show you what I what I did from scratch. Okay, let's say we were, we're just starting from the beginning. First thing you got to do is make a new library. Actually, first thing you got to do is you have to understand the nomenclature of Final Cut. Certain things are named differently than what you would expect. A library is what I'm used to calling a project. It's the file that holds everything. We're calling that a library now. And I can name it anything I want. I'm going to call it Snow 2 because I've already done this. I'm not going to save the results. I'm just going to stick it in my movies folder. My movies folder is on my internal hard drive, and my internal hard drive is an SSD hard drive. And SSD hard drives, uh, solid state drives, are much, 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 much faster than the regular old USB, regular old platter and tone arm style hard drives that everybody's been using for the last 30 years. Uh, and uh, so it makes everything faster when you go to render. You've got to actually make your movie everything much faster, save you lots of time. So SSD drives are preferred when doing digital video because digital video is the most stressful thing, one of the most stressful things you can do with a computer. Anyway, so here we go. We got a new library and I got to go get that. Um, that video and here's my here's my movie right there and I'm just gonna say import the selected file and there it is and uh, if I try playing this here the space bar yeah that's the file and it's still in slow motion I'm gonna make a new project a project is what you used to call a, a timeline I'm gonna call this snow 2 uh, and it's uh, the, the it says here the video is going to be set on the first video clip properties that means whatever I drag into the timeline, it's going to wake up and go, oh, you want me to be that kind of video? So I'm going to say, okay. And I'm going to drag this over here, and it's going to just kind of drop it in. And hey, look at that. If I go like this. Look at that. It's playing properly. This is the only way to maintain the slow-mo properties is fix it in iMovie first on the phone, and then export it. And then you can do whatever you want with it. Okay, so there's a few things we want to do. I'm, I'm going to I want to make this a seamless loop. All right. So first thing we gotta do is gotta stabilize it. I'm gonna click the stabilization button over here. Uh, and it's thinking for a couple of minutes. I'm running an iMac Pro, a 10 core iMac Pro with like, uh, I think it's 64 gigs of RAM. Let's take a look here. Um, it's a pretty fast machine. Yeah, it's a 10 core iMac Pro, 64 gigs of RAM. And the graphics card has its own 16 gigs. Yes, it does. That's why we can do virtual reality. On this, on this machine. Uh, but anyway, so it renders fairly quickly. But you see this little set of dotted lines at the top here? It means it hasn't it hasn't finished rendered. I'm going to be doing all kinds of stuff here before I'm done with this. Um, but if you're working on a machine that's not as fast as this one and you just need to kind of get to work and, and the machine seems to be bogging down, one of the things you can do is go up here and go to the preferences and uh, go into, let's see, See, where is it? Uh, it's playback. And I have background render turned off. Okay, that means, what this means is that if you don't do anything for like however long, however many seconds, it'll start rendering whatever's on your timeline. That's That can be really great and really helpful uh, at times, but if, like I say, if your machine is slow or whatever and you just want to focus on work, turn that off. Render what you want, when you want. Also, if you've got a crap ton of effects that's really bogging things down, uh, turn that off too, and just render a tiny, a tiny segment of what of what you need, and uh, and double check your effects stack that way, rather than eating up crap loads of time. All right, so uh, here's what we're gonna do. We've got the stabilization on. I'm gonna go in here, uh, and I'm gonna say I want this to be a hi, sweetheart. Hello, yes. Yeah, I can't let her. She wants to eat these headphones. Yeah, you know, you you've destroyed multiple sets of headphones. Can't let that happen. All right. I put it on tripod mode. That is going to make it stable. See, look at that, nice and stable. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is going to fix the color. So let's see. Got to go over here to our effects, and the very first thing is the color board. Going to drop that onto here, and uh, you may notice. They may have noticed that I've got this spectrograph looking thing over here. This is under the view menu, show in viewer video scopes or command seven normally it looks like this you have to go ask for it it's over here and you want this open when you're doing your 
color correction. The idea is that the blacks should never be below the zero line too much, and the whites should never be above the 100 line too much. And when I click this little multicolored triangle over here on the color board, hey, look at this. I got three tabs here. I got color, which I'm not going to mess with. The saturation, which is the amount of color, and the exposure, which is the lightness and darkness. I'm going to go to the saturation first, and the first thing I always do is get rid of all the color because this simplifies things. I'm now looking just at the contrast of the picture. Now, looking here, it's fairly light. So what I want to do is I want to crush the blacks. So you're pulling the blacks down until they just kind of touch the, the zero down there. And I want to get the whites a little bit so they pop nice. And then the, the mid-range here, season to taste. Use a combination of your eyes and the scopes. Right? I, I like to not rely solely on one or the other. I like to look at it, get the feel for the mood I'm trying to get about in there. But I also want to be able to see the bricks on the bottom there, the bottom of the park, and not lose that detail. So maybe I might bring up the black a little more. Yeah, okay, let's see here. In that, in that ballpark. I want to have a fair amount of contrast. Okay, so it stands out. That's, that's pretty good. That's, that's pretty good. Okay. So there's that. <coughs> now, um, now, here's the other thing. I got a person down there in the lower right hand corner. If I want to make this a loop, I'm going to have a person walking around, 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 around. You can't have that. That's what we got so far here. It's looking pretty good. First, I'm going to just get rid of the audio because I don't need any audio on this. Okay. But I got to get rid of this person. Well, here's the concept. <clears throat> I'm going to make a copy of this video and stack it on top of itself, and I'm going to cut a hole in it, in the in the area, just in the area where that person appears, in the screen, just just in that area. They're there for the whole duration of the clip, so it'll be a carbon copy of the clip on top of itself. It'll look like just like a little window, cut right in it, that I can see through the clip below it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the clip below it. I'm going to take the other side of the screen where that person isn't. I'm going to move it over. And so when you're looking through that window, you're actually looking through the other side of the of the wall in that in the place where that person was. And because these bricks are all like that, you're not going to see the seam because the snow is falling at the same rate and in the same direction. And I'm going to keep it lateral. You're not going to see any shift that way. So let's do that. Um, here we go. I'm going to option okay, drag this thing on top of itself. And uh, let's see, I'm going to disable the bottom one. It's V for disable for some reason. Uh, okay, I've selected the top clip and I need a mask. mask. Okay. I like to use the draw mask because I can draw it myself. Now let's see here. You see See the head moving bottom right hand, bottom right hand corner. Okay, they're gonna we're gonna start at the beginning and I'm gonna start over here. It wants me to click and put a point. I'm gonna start about here. I'm gonna go up to about here, and then I'm gonna scrub all the way down to the end, almost the end, and I'm gonna click over here. I want to keep this as minimal as possible. Let me put that up a little bit and then click down here. And then watch when I go back here to this first point, you see how the, the cursor has a plus next to it? It looks like a fountain pen and it's got a, a plus next to it. But when I get in proximity to this last point, it turns to an O, that means it's going to close the, uh, the shape. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna close the, the loop and it's gonna make a complete shape. When I click on that, suddenly that's all that you can see. That's our little window. Uh, but it's actually looking the wrong way. It's actually cut out everything that we want to see and it needs to be inverted. Okay, so now I'm going to enable the one below it. And if I scrub back and forth, you can see there's no difference, right? But if I hide the one on top and go down here and I change the position by clicking the transform, it's the X value, and I start moving this over. Get past beyond that person there. Let me look around in here. Let's see what happens when I re-enable this. Can I get them all? Let's see. Oh, almost. 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 
So he's going to start over here. Right? See how much further over we are now? Let's move this some more. And as I move this some more, you're going to see... Go away. Yeah, go on. Here, look at that. Make him futz futz a little bit here until it looks like it's... So it looks like it's real. So as long as let's see, how far can I go? I don't know quite always, can I? Oh, let's see, how do I like that? That's pretty good. Okay, now when I scrub back and forth, hey, look at that. They are completely gone. So I'm stabilized and I've gotten rid of stray people. Like cutting a hole and showing a different part of the video that's also stable. That's how you do that. Now there's one other piece I need to do, which is make this seamless, because again, the last frame does not match up with the first frame, even in, even in tripod mode. So, <clears throat> so what I need to do is, I need to make a, co a copy of this entire thing. I'm going to, first of all, let's do this. Let's make a compound clip, so this whole thing is like one unit. I'm going to call a snow clip. I usually call my compound clips CC, so I can see them easily over here. Oh, that's a compound clip. You see it's got a little icon in the upper left that tells me that too. <clears throat> the thing about that is if I ever need to change anything, if I just double click it, I can go back into the original like this. I just drilled into it. Shift Z to see the entire clip in the available window space. And then I can, uh, you know, go in and make any changes that I like. And then go back by clicking this back arrow, go back out to my main timeline. And uh, there's the whole thing nested inside one object. This makes it a lot easier to handle. So uh, let me shrink this up a little bit so I got some room to see what I'm doing. Uh, so here's what I need to do. I need to make a slice. Since, since the last frame does not end up matching up with the first frame, I have to make an artificial new beginning and end of the clip where it does match up. And I also have to create a transition between the end and the beginning that covers the scene. Let me do that through a cross dissolve. But the first thing is make sure, making sure that it's going to begin and end at the same point so you know that you're going to have a frame accurate seamless loop. So the way that we do that is let's cut in a few seconds here. Let's go out to like 10 seconds. Okay. 10 seconds on the dot. I mean, it can be anything, but the, the point is the main thing is you got to be consistent. Okay, 10 seconds on the dot. I'm putting a marker there. I'm not going to cut it yet. M. Okay, and then let's see, I'm going to duplicate this and drag this over here. Okay, so what's got to happen now is that it's got to begin here and it's got to end here and it's got to have a dissolve here. So I'm going to go over here. I have the snap on, by the way, that's this thing. Snap so that when I, when I move around, it kind of goes pop on that little marker thing there so I know I'm right on the line. And then uh, Command B to slice it. And select it and delete. Go down here. Pop right there. Hello. Pop right on the on the marker. And command B. And delete. Okay. So now this frame here. Look at that. That's the end. That's the home. Those are right on. Now what I got to do is make this make the transition at what used to be the beginning and the end point. But in order to do that, I need a little room to breathe on either side. So I'm going to go, it, I don't have to be precise here. Let's see, what do we got? 30, 31, 32, 33, four seconds, five seconds. You know, a nice, nice long cross dissolve. Yeah, sure. Let's say five seconds thereabouts. Okay, B to blade that. Come over here. Same deal, just roughly in place. This is the end. I'm slicing off the beginning and the end here. The beginning of the first one and the end of the last one so that they've got room to breathe here when I go over and bring over a cross dissolve. It's under the under the transitions here, and I'm just going to drag that in. It's the first one in the top left of the transitions. And then when I see the cursor changes to like this bracket thing when I go to either side, that means I can click and drag and change the duration. Right? Oh, look at that. See it turned to the red on the left side? That means I'm out of frames. So, But this is like a seven, eight second long transition. You are never going to see that. Let me select it and hit delete and just show you quickly what it looks like without it. Without it, you're going to see a definite pop right there. We should see that again. Boop. See that? There's a different boop. The light shifted. Right. If I undo that, put that back. Let's take a look at that again. And you are not going to see that. 
you are not going to see that change because it just really morphs from one to the other. Okay, so it's completely seamless in the middle and uh, at the beginning and the end. Okay, so now I could make a compound clip out of this whole thing if I wanted to, but actually the main thing now is just to go ahead and export it because this is a standalone file. Now here's where we get to rendering and all like that. Uh, <clears throat> if you're... Um, uh, if you're if you've got a bunch of effects and stuff like that and you're not sure that you really want to go with it what I recommend doing is pick a little chunk in the middle someplace that's an absolute torture test like your worst case scenario you go command B and a little chunk of it here like this command B and just have this one little thing selected and then go up to the modify menu and select render selection only render that one little piece that's a lot faster see those little dots at the top of the timeline went away now that means that this is rendered that's how that's really gonna look as opposed to its approximation where you have these little little dots, this little trail at the top that means I'm not rendered yet. Well, Thelma is back as you can see. Uh, so let's talk about rendering a little bit. One thing is that you don't need to render your video in order to uh, get a good export or to get an export that will be the equivalent of what you asked for on the timeline. You don't need to render in order to make that happen. It'll render as it actually makes the file. Uh, furthermore, I don't think you actually save time uh, by, <laughs> by pre-rendering stuff before sending it to, uh, to be final rendered, uh, to be shared. Uh, and that is different than it used to be a long time ago. So, um, so here's the thing. And there's only a couple of, of things you really kind of need to know about rendering. Let's take a look. Um, under the file menu is share. And under here is a whole bunch of options, okay? More options than you actually need. And if you need more options than they give you, you can also add your own here. Uh, like for instance, I made my own for exporting WAV files because that's something I have to do a lot. And I want to just have a handy way to just export just the audio and just in WAV format. All right, save only, I don't need to go anything else. I just wanted a quick and dirty way to be able to do that. Now, um, I actually don't use a lot of these. <laughs> I don't use Prepare for Facebook. I probably, maybe I should. I think I've tried the uh, Publish Direct to, to YouTube thing, uh, but I generally, I'll show you what I do. I have, I have certain recipes that I use uh, that just, you know what, they have the advantage of working every friggin' time the way I want them to. So I go into the share menu and I just go to master file. And under master file here is where I can give it a name, which I will. And then I go into the settings here. Now this says 1920 by 30 FIPS at 48K and all like that. That stuff was set up when I set up the, um, uh, what are we calling this? <laughs> library, we call these things uh, projects now. I think of them as timelines, but they call it a project now. Yeah. Uh, that is the, uh, the project properties. If you need to change that, you need to select the project over here and then go over to this, this tab that's over here under the inspector and go in, into this business here and make your changes there. And the, the, you don't modify it when it's time to go share it. You, you modify it when you were doing the original thing in the first place. So at this point, we're ready to actually share it with the world. So here we go over to the master file thing and uh, we go into settings. Now, you've got some options here. The top one is video and audio. You can do just video or audio only. And then you got these things down here. We're going to get to these in a second. Uh, but let's start with video and audio. There's really, if you look under video codec, the codec means uh, the flavor, uh, the algorithm that it's using to compress your video. And uh, different codecs have different results and are useful for different kinds of things. There are only three out of this out of this drop down menu. There are only three that I have currently in the last currently meaning the last 30 years uh, have ever used. Uh, one is ProRes 422 uh, is H264 and the other one is ProRes 4444. And that one I only use very, very rarely and for very specific things and one specific thing in particular. If I'm making a video that has a transparent or semi-transparent background that I'm going to overlay over top of another piece of video, uh, that is what that is for. Specifically that, and that's kind of the only thing that's for. Um, for most people, these other modes like XQ and HQ and LT and, and all this sort of stuff, if you're doing uh, broadcast quality uh, work and working with high-end uh, video cameras like that, that's where that stuff will come in handy. But for most civilians, 
Uh, and I still count myself <laughs> among them even after all this time. For most civilians, you're going to be either using ProRes 422 to make your final archived version that you want to keep in perpetuity, final, that's your master, or you're going to be using H.264 for something that you're going to be sending out to the web uh, or YouTube or Vimeo or any place else like that. And that's pretty much it. So that means that for most of the time, eight out of 10 times, you're going to be going here. This number here, 86.8 megs. If I go down here, that's the bigger, that's the biggest number. That's the biggest number. So it's going to be the, the highest uh, quality selecting that option. See, it's even under mastering as opposed to publishing. If I go to Apple devices, you'll see that number goes down to 39 megs, regardless of whether it's faster in code or better quality. Or if I select computer, it's 78 megs, that's closer. Or 58 megs for web hosting. But if I go back to video and audio and just select H.264, you see it's 86 megs. So that means it's going to be a higher bandwidth file because it's going to take up more room. That tells us it's going to be a higher bandwidth file because it takes up more room. Now, there's nothing in here that tells you why these numbers are changing, but I can tell you what it is. It has to do with the amount of squishing and compressing that it's doing in order to uh, in order to fit that file size. And when you do that, the more you do that, the more video quality you give up because you have to, because something's got to give, and it's got to start throwing pixels over the side in order to get the file size down small enough. So a larger size means better looking, uh, less compression, uh, more like the original final, you know, master that you want to have. So actually what I do is uh, I will do, I will go to Apple devices and I will say better quality. And what that means is it actually makes two passes through the video. It makes one pass through and it's like, okay, I'm going to look at every frame and what are the predominant colors and how much motion is there and just like kind of get the lay of the land of the whole thing first. All right, now that I know that, now I'm going to go through. I know where I have to go. Now I'm going to go through and compress every frame. So that's actually, you are going to end up with better quality that way because the algorithm knows more about what it needs to know, but it's going to take longer uh, in order to do it. Uh, again, if you've got a really long piece and you're really concerned about the quality, take a small section of it. Take the, take the most important, most torture, to, torture test part of it, or if it's spread out, if there's several torture test sections over a longer period, chop them up and just, just glom them together and make a little torture test project and try that. And, and, and once you've got that down, then you can apply what you learned from that to the whole, sh the whole shebang and save yourself a lot of time. <clears throat> and then just click next and, and uh, it's gonna ask you for a place to, uh, uh, to drop it somewhere and uh, off you go, click save and, and it'll do its thing. I'm not going to bother doing that right now because I've already I've already done that. <laughs> I already did this before I did this video, uh, but I can show you what the final looks like. It uh, zoop. It's out of the way. Yeah. and that's 1080p. And I can use that as a background, like for a green screen background or what have you, or tidal background for something bleak and wintry. Uh, but uh, but there you go. Right, that's it. Hit me with questions, and I'll make a video about it. All right, later.